Thanks. So hey everyone, um, my name is Robert Soden. I'm with uh, World Bank's Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, GFDRR. Uh, I'm also a PhD student at the University of Colorado Boulder. I'll be presenting today on a research project that's in progress. Um, and it's uh, looking at the relationship between governments and volunteer geographic information projects like OpenStreetMap. Um, this project is a collaboration. Uh, we're working with Mookie Hackley and a team he's assembled over at University College London, um, some folks at the World Bank, and you guys. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means and how to participate over the course of the talk. Um, but first I want to just sort of zoom out a little bit and talk about why, does, why is the World Bank, why is GFDRR interested in OSM and what, what motivated this research. Um, so GFDR is the part of the World Bank um, that works to help developing countries um, ensure that their development process is, is resilient to disasters and they're able to understand and manage um, the risks posed by, by natural hazards. Last year we worked in over 80 different countries um, along roughly sort of five pillars of, of work. Risk identification, risk reduction, preparedness, financial protection, and resilient recovery. Um, and it's really that first pillar that, that I work on and that's going to be most interesting to what we're talking about today, and that is risk identification. Um, so we know that disaster risk is, is the result of sort of a complex and dynamic relationship between natural phenomenon such as earthquakes or storms and, and socially produced vulnerability to those phenomenons. So how we build our buildings, where we put our cities, how we organize our economies and set up our governments all have complex relationships with, with the nature of risk. Um, and so the first step then is, is tra trying to really understand and manage that risk. Um, this is a complicated science. It really began with uh, the nuclear power industry, trying to understand where to site nuclear reactors, what precautions to take when building them. Um, later on, it became picked up more by insurance and reinsurance industries, trying to set premiums and these sorts of things. Um, and then recently, we're starting to see it really be being taken up in international development, thinking about disaster risk reduction and preparedness. Um, and so for a long time GFTR was funding risk assessments um, and kind of the general process, the way in which it would work would be we'd find sort of the best scientists and the best engineers, um, send them out to work with our, our partner governments. Um, they'd go around to different ministries, collect data, disappear, uh, run their models, come back, you know, six, ten months later, uh, convene a stakeholder workshop. Um, present, this is your risk, hand over uh, the results in a shiny PDF. Um, and what we found was this was a valid approach for, for producing good risk assessments, for doing good science. But what, it's, what it failed at was, and what we really saw was that it very often didn't lead to actual changes in behavior, changes in, in policy based, uh, based on that science. And for me there's Broadly speaking, two reasons why, why it's interesting to us today um, that uh, these practices were failing. And the first is, is the data was never released. Um, it was often just died on some consultant's hard drive, buried into a PDF. So there's no way to validate the models. There's no way to reproduce the models. And as we know, science works a lot around the idea of peer review. And so the inability to, to review, to interact, to work with this data um, often failed to lead to the kind of scientific consensus that was necessary to make the hard decisions, the tough decisions involved in, in disaster risk management. Um, and second, there was no broad participation. Often many of the citizens involved had just like no visibility into the process, um, little awareness that this process was even going on. So with these th kinds of things in mind, in 2011 we will launch the Open Data for Resilience Initiative, Open DRI. Uh, John Crowley is going to talk in a little bit uh, in more detail about sort of what this project is and how we work, um, but it's important that, that OpenStreetMap and, and learning how to talk to governments about OSM has been a really critical part of that work and a very challenging part of that work for us. Um, and 
I think, yeah, and it's key. OSM is 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 very different approach from the kinds of GIS and the kinds of surveying techniques that are used by by our counterparts in government, and that's part of why it's awesome. That's why it's, it's exciting, right? But it's also raises a lot of questions, and there's a lot of things that we found our team didn't really know how to answer. Um, and our team is actually has a lot of people involved that have been working with OSM for a while, have been contributing to the community for a while. Um, and we're just sort of one small part of a much larger uh, World Bank organization in which there's a lot of interest in OSM at the moment. Um, OSM kind of sits at the intersection of a couple of different themes that are really sexy within the bank right now. Um, stuff around innovations and in technology, community participation and development, open data. So these are all things that, are, that a lot of people in the World Bank are interested in right now. And so you have all these people that are running around trying to um, understand what is OpenStreetMap, how do I incorporate in my projects, who do I talk to in the OSM community, what's worked well, what makes sense. Um, and we looked around and we saw there was um, a number of anecdotes and examples of government engagement with OSM, but there wasn't any resource that we could point folks to um, that would start to sketch this out in, in a way that was sort of meaningful and useful to their work. Um, so, now that I've spent basically my entire presentation motivating my presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the research. Um, so, we're taking a very inductive approach. We're trying to collect as many case studies as we can and understand what, what themes and what general topics emerge from them. And in the spirit of OpenStreetMap, we're, we're crowdsourcing this process as much as possible. We've set up a website at crowdgov.wordpress.com. Anyone can go there um, and submit a story, submit a case. Um, this is what the form looks like. It's pretty tedious and kind of long. It has a lot of um, fields. I feel like this has probably diminished the amount of contributions we've gotten so far. Um, so if you'd rather just talk to me about it, I'll, I, we can do that and I'll, and I'll fill it out. Um, but so far we've collected 26 cases. Um, of them, 18 are related to OpenStreetMap. Um, eight others are from sort of other projects within uh, other VGI spaces. So we've got one on Fix My Streets. There's one on like the California roadkill observation thing. Uh, there's another one on like links and bear tracking in Scandinavia. So all kinds of VGI projects. Um, I should say that 18 of them at the moment are from you know what we call developed countries. Um, eight are from developing countries. We're looking to get that to a little bit more parity as we start to better document some of our own work around the World Bank. Um, 17 are currently at the national level. Eight are at city, um, and one is supranational. That's the the Minx and Lynx tracking project in Scandinavia. There's a couple of different agencies involved with that. Um, Thematically, we're starting to group them together. I imagine this will change as we start to collect more and think a little bit harder about sort of sectoral-wise what to focus on. But at the moment, um, there's six that are broadly related to the environment, eight to planning, and a lot of those are transportation. Um, Ten around disaster risk reduction and response, which really speaks to the, the kinds of work that our team is engaged with and, and the kinds of case studies we know. I again imagine that this will sort of level out over time. Um, and then five more on census and, and cadaster. Um, so in terms of some emerging themes, uh, again, we're still very much in the sort of data collection process. Um, so we haven't, the, the analysis is, is certainly not final. Uh, but these are some of the things that I've seen in my own sort of overview of the case studies and, and the ones I've been collecting. First is, is the importance of having a champion in government for this, and I think that's kind of obvious. Um, but what I'm hoping that the research will, will show, will allow us to talk a, a little bit more about, is sort of what makes these champions successful and what, what, and what doesn't. Um, and, and, and more directly, how can, what resources, what tools, what approaches can we take that will help enable those champions that, that are excited about OSM, that are pushing it within their own ministry or their own department. Um, what can we do to help them succeed? Because I think that's, that's super important. Um, second, who is OpenStreetMap? This is something that's just confusing to 
not just government, but a lot of different organizations that are trying to figure out how to interact with the OSM community. Um, who do I talk to? There, there isn't an 800 number. Um, it often just seems like a lot of different people that are doing a lot of different things, and it's, it's difficult and confusing to know when I need help with something, uh, who can I reach out to? Who's going to be responsible for, for, for responding to that? Um, there's this whole sort of ball of issues around um, government responsibility around creating, maintaining authoritative data sets um, and the liabilities that come with that, um, along with you know just general questions around quality, acceptance, fit, fitness for purpose uh, of the data. And what other research has really shown um, is that when compared to authoritative data sets, OSM on a quality level actually stands up pretty well and in many cases surpasses quote unquote authoritative data. But governments have a unique responsibility to, to, to stamp um, these data sets and, and figuring out a process by which um, VGI could do this is something that I know we have colleagues working on in Indonesia um, but isn't well documented and isn't well known. Um, one of the other things that, that's coming up a lot um, that was interesting to me is, is, the, is the cost of producing data. Uh, everyone knows it's expensive to do good surveying, to do good mapping, um, and as budgets are getting cut in many different projects in many different parts of the world uh, for government agencies, we see them more and more turning to, to OSM and, and other sorts of projects like it. Um, and finally, the license. This has come up a lot this weekend, but it's something that we've been talking about for a couple of years now. Um, I'm not going to take a particular stance on, on share alike at the moment, but what I will say is that explaining the license to our counterparts in government, our counterparts that are working in the World Bank teams, um, is very difficult. And, and what I've heard over the course of this conference is actually reinforces that is there's wildly different understandings of what share alike means and so if that's going to stay then we at least need much better guidance on um, on how it plays out and what the the impacts of, of share alike are um, but honestly the most interesting thing that I found so far um, is not so much it's not an if question there's a lot of interest there's a lot of, of of enthusiasm both in the World Bank and in, and in government about how about OpenStreetMap. So it's not so much convincing people that you need to do it, it's more of a question of how does that work. Um, and one of the fascinating things about what we've seen so far is there's such an incredibly broad range of modalities of engagement. Um, to use some examples just from the US, we have um, you know State Department Humanitarian Information Unit releasing imagery to the Hawk community and getting hundreds of people on it and tracing it at a, an event organized or co-organized by USAID. Um, we have the Portland TriMet group hiring their own mappers and setting them out to collect data around transportation and for transportation planning. Um, we have National Park Service not using the data but by using the software stack. And so this really broad range of possibilities for how governments can um, engage with OSM is super interesting to me and I'm hoping that as the research progresses we'll be able to flesh some of these out uh, and talk about what are your options and, and what's worked well and really document some successful case studies and I think this is going to be very valuable um, for our teams in the World Bank as they start to think about how to use OSM um, as part of their projects and how to talk to their counterparts in government about some of their options. Um, so as I said, we're still um, in the midst of, of collecting case studies. Um, that's happening through the, through the rest of April. Um, in May, we'll really start, kind of put our head down and do some writing. Um, June, we'll send it out to review, do some design work, and we're hoping to launch um, in early July at a conference called Understanding Risk. That'll be from June 30th to July 4th in London. Um, if you're in London at that time and you're interested in this sort of thing, I highly recommend you come. Uh, there's going to be, at the moment, about a thousand people registered. Um, everyone from sort of the World Bank and partner governments to technology organizations, insurance companies, um, satellite agencies, looking at innovations in 
disaster risk modeling. There's going to be a number of sessions in which OSM will be featured. Um, we're looking to do at least one training and we're hoping to organize a mapping party uh, one of the evenings with some of the, the individuals from the local London OSM community. And so it should be a lot of fun. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, last, I just want to make a, one more call for, for case studies and for participation. This is a, designed as a collaborative project. It was first discussed uh, last September at the State of the Map in Birmingham. Um, and we had a lot of really good conversation there. We've gotten a lot of help from various individuals in the OSM community in terms of documenting case studies. So we're certainly looking for more of those. We've got 26 now, trying to get it up to around 40. Um, beyond the individual case studies, if you have ideas and input in terms of the kinds of questions we should be asking, uh, different directions that the research would take, we'd love to hear it. Um, and if you're interested in reviewing uh, the document, as I mentioned, that's going to happen in June, so please let me know. Um, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.